that's happened. Yeah? But we don't see what happened in the past. How, they used to live fantastically in the past. How did that happen? You don't know because you don't get taught this in school. Yeah, it was social equality. And, and, and it was dealing with minorities and minority rights because, as we said in the prophetic tradition, there's another one that says, you will not smell the fragrance of paradise if you harm a non-Muslim under our protection. So, you know, these are kind of the, 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 the rights and the emphasis on taking care of the minorities. I mean, you hear David Cameron say, if you harm, if you harm a, I don't know, if you harm a Pakistani, it's like harming David Cameron. Does he say that? Have you heard that? Have you heard of good old Dave? Of oh, some of you, Dawood, come on. Yeah. <laughs> you know, have you heard that? No, you don't. I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to say anything bad about him, but I'm trying to show you that these are explicit emotional principles. You harm a non Muslim under our protection, you're harming the Prophet himself. You saw the crazy furore that happened in Europe. Hundred people died, embassies were burned because of someone drew a cartoon, for God's sake. Now imagine if you harm a non Muslim under the protection of Muslim. It's like harming the Prophet. Then the Muslims should have an uproar to defend the rights of minorities. Muslims don't know this, and non Muslims don't know this. That's the unfortunate reality. But yeah. So, you were taught that by a Muslim. That's where are you from? Morocco. Oh dear. There you go. There you go. But this is the problem with the Islamic world. It gets it digresses into failure and destruction the further away it moves from Islam. The closer it comes to Islam, the more liberated it becomes. And we've seen this. The Muslim world was so great for the peace and tranquility, but yet now dictatorships. Why? Because they have like alien penal codes, they have Alien values, they have a mismatch of communism, dictatorship, uh, you know, Machiavellian principles, they have a cocktail of political theories that has destroyed them. Yeah? That's why we had the Arab Spring, because the world said they don't represent us, isn't it? Anyway, thank you for that point, very good point. Any other question? Anyone who just asked a question, who wants to ask a question? Don't worry about time, I could be here all day. So if you be here all day, we could be here all day. The first point I just want to ask uh, about um, is uh, also about the marriage. Uh, Prophet Muhammad uh, had exceeded, peace be upon him, had exceeded the, the limit of uh, wives that he could get married to. Can you like just tell us any justifications? Are you married? Sorry? Are you married? No. That's why you ask me questions about marriage. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, another point I just remembered that uh, um, there were three tribes of Jewish people living in Medina at the time of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And uh, one of these tribes were ordered by Prophet Muhammad to be uh, so the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. to be like also like thrown out of the exile. The, yeah, exile, yeah. basically. Out of the city. Like can you if you just um, describe to us like what happened? You're bringing all the hot potatoes there, aren't you? <laughs> That's fine. That's Thank fine. You. That's what Google does. That's a shame. <laughs> uh, okay, the first point on um, the marriage of Prophet uh, is an exception to a legal process where he was allowed to marry more. And many of his marriages were what you would call political marriages as well to bring different tribes together. And that's what happened. He never married for lust. He married widows, divorcees, women much older than him. And you saw how he brought the Arabian Peninsula together. He married a Jew, Safiya. Okay, so was him. And you see a lot of hikmah, a lot of wisdom in the, in the, in the marriages of the Prophet from the UP. He actually brought the Muslim world together, brought the world together from that perspective. That's the first point. The second point is about the Jewish tribe. See, look, Islam is not anti-Semitic or anti-Jew, yeah? Because even when you read the Quran, it talks about Bani Israel, the people of Israel, yeah? These were Muslims. That's the point. And it is shown to us in our history when there were Muslims, some Muslims were naughty. And look what God did, yeah? So it's not saying, but a lot of us, we read it in the wrong eye, we think, look, it's the Jews. No, no. These people were Muslims. God is talking to them as Muslims, which means people who submit to the will of God. That's the first point. Second point, by looking at the historical act we just discussed, Jews thrived under Islam. We never had an issue with Jewish people. Even at the time of the Prophet, Islam, the Prophet never wanted to harm Jews or any human being. There's a famous prophetic tradition that says there is no harming and no reciprocating of harm. However, the Prophet was a 
was a, was a leader and he was a statesman. And he had to be wise and give rulings, which we believe are a form of revelation. There was a time when a Jewish tribe broke the treaty. Not only did they break the treaty, they wanted to kill and annihilate all the Muslims. Not all the Jews, it was a tribe. Remember, it was a tribe. So we're not saying it was because they were Jews intrinsically. No, it was a political issue. It was a tribal issue. They wanted to annihilate all the Muslims. So the ruling there was that they had to be punished. And that's similar to any, any kind of act in the constitution, whether it's treason or whatever the case may be. And we would argue this wasn't an act of barbarity, it was actually an act of mercy. Now, let me tell you what I mean by that. Because if we didn't have principles at that time to protect the state, which included Muslims and non-Muslims, if there were no protective mechanisms, such as punishments for people who would annihilate you, if there were no protective mechanisms, you may not have had Muslims at all. Do you see the point here? For example, is it merciful if David Cameron were to say, come on France, Wipe us clean. The French army were to come and invade our lands and want to wipe every single Briton and kill them. Is that a merciful thing for David Cameron to allow to happen? What would be merciful if he gets these bandits of French that come and want to invade and kill all the Brits and he uses them as an example and he says it's not because they're French, it's because they're politically, ideologically motivated and they want to kill every single one of us, so we're using them as a lesson. That's merciful from a political, judicial, legal perspective. Because there's a mechanism to establish the safety of others. Does that make sense? That's what, but a lot of historians, they sex up the narrative thinking Muhammad upon his was anti-Jew, he was an annihilate tribe. No, it wasn't. They broke the law, the treaty, they broke it twice. They wanted to annihilate all the people of Medina. So therefore, there was repercussions. And those repercussions, we believe, were firm. They were suitably harsh, but they were necessary to ensure the safety and peace of everybody else. What was the treaty about? Well, that they don't fight each other, they, they, they stay together. Yeah, they, they read, they read the Treaty of Medina, it's online. It's a beautiful treaty. The, 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 the person says, we treat the Jews like our own people. You know, if they get harmed, we have to protect them. Yeah, you see? So there was a particular tribe that actually just wanted to annihilate the whole, the whole state. So what do you do? You just say, yeah, take me, turn in the cheek, you've got no cheeks left. Politically, you have to leave. I'm not a pacifist, but I'm not you know, aggressive either. I don't believe that we should wage war, but being, being pacifist is, is incoherent practically, yeah? especially at that time. There will be, no, be no Islam, there will be no human being left. <laughs> yeah, it would be crazy. So you have to lay down certain laws in place or certain actions that were protective mechanisms to ensure the safety and peace of the entire Medina society. Make sense? But does it apply to them nowadays? Well, if it was an Islamic State, probably. Yeah, but we don't have an Islamic State, so it's all happened there. I have a question here. Yeah? yeah, sure. Hi, my question is just I want you to elaborate in some things a bit. Sure. Times, I guess, in the West right now. People ask me from the perspective of the message of the Islam, at the basis which is Islam defined to be peace and all kinds of things you know. Yes. So in terms of people are asking, Islam has been spread by, by, by soul, yes. which is Muhammad is a jihadi person. Yes. Did you think that is applied to the message of Muhammad right now about what you're talking about is a peaceful and nice message and all that kind of things? Uh, yeah. So how can you prove that? Well, it is true that we have jihad in Islam, um, but jihad doesn't mean killing innocent human beings, it doesn't equate with terrorism. I mean, Fox News want you to think that, but that's not true. If there are treaties on jihad, it's basically a, a, a divine principle which is removing the obstacle that prevents the establishment of peace and harmony. And sometimes that process requires, after diplomacy, warfare. Okay? And you see this, there's similar principles like liberal interventionism if you study politics. Liberal nations will intervene in countries militarily to ensure democracy thrives or peace and justice thrives. Same principle in Islam. This is why the Quran says, what is the matter with you? They don't fight in God's cause. They don't struggle in God's cause. For those people of that town that are oppressed and the women and children are crying, when will God's help come? And then God says, God help is near. 
So sometimes there is a necessary removal of an obstacle that prevents that that that, that is a preventor to justice and harmony. For example, say there was a genocide in uh, Russia, but it's Stalin. Stalin killed six million Christians. Yeah. If there was an Islamic country, proper one, an ideal utopia, if it existed, it would have used the concept of jihad to intervene and remove that oppression and that genocide to establish peace in that nation. So that's what jihad is from that perspective. So this is how Muslims see the spreading of Islam. The spreading of Islam was, yes, by conveying the message, but in the early history, without doubt, if anyone says anything different to another planet, was, yes, by the sword. But what does that mean? It wasn't like, become a Muslim or chop your head off. No, that's illegal. That's illegal. There's probably no one instance of legal force conversions in Islam. Not one instance, ever. 